judgment rules that indeed it can, and it's the role of customary law to um, develop in relation to the Constitution and to bring itself in line with the Constitution. Right? So that these kinds of discussions around same-sex marriage certainly feed into those broader divisions and uh, broader debate, debates. And a particularly narrow concept of culture um, uh, uh, as static, as something that doesn't change and doesn't develop. And I think we see this in particular in relation to the emergence over the last 20 years of a very strong LGBT movement within Sub-Saharan Africa. So we see organizations emerging from all over the continent. We see controversies in Liberia, in Malawi, in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in Senegal, in Kenya, in Uganda, an emergence of an African-based LGBT movement. And the kinds of debates that we see happening in a small town in rural Malanga, even though in South Africa we are in a unique situation of having a constitution that protects minority rights, is these kinds of debates are happening all over the subcontinent. And it makes the kind of work that we do as a human rights um, organization particularly complex, especially an organization that's perceived to be based in the West and um, intervening in a kind of human rights discourse within a continent in which homosexuality itself is cast as a foreign import. And the emphasis on LGBT rights is seen to be incompatible with cultural and traditional <coughs> norms. So I think what this does is to unpack some of the underlying issues at stake with the rise of homophobia. What does it signify? How is it about a reaction to the erosion of patriarchal values? A sort of anxiety about changing gender norms and practices. So how might we understand homophobia in a broader context within Sub-Saharan Africa and then be able to make uh, appropriate interventions to the, the kinds of rights claims that are increasingly being made by LGBT organizations in the subcontinent. I think I'll leave it there then. Well, thank you very much, Jan. There are certainly quite a number of issues that I think uh, some of us will want to engage with. Uh, that was a most uh, fascinating presentation. So I'll now open it to, to the audience to ask questions, to comment. Remember, if it's a comment, please make it very, very brief. Questions too. Please get to the point. Thanks, Yeah. that was very interesting. My only concern is that there's a way in which the, the way you've presented this suggests that in South African popular consciousness there's a very close relationship between custom, patriarchy, conservatism, and an opposition to modernity, an opposition to, 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 to gayness and to gay rights that would come from that. And I don't know if that lines up with my own sense of the way in which people think about custom in many parts of rural South Africa, where it's not so much that this is uh, something that people take as being the, 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 the opposite of the modern, but rather that custom provides a language for thinking about, well, forms of law in a very modern sense, which is as a Kantian space of dignity, as opposed to heteronomy, that which you can construct for yourself as a community, that which you've been able to hold to yourself the, the dignity you've been able to hold to yourself as a community against white intrusion, against poverty, against economic insecurity, against the inability to create relationships, to create families. And so when you think about it that way, as I say, it comes very close to a Kantian notion of dignity that begins to feel very modern. And you can begin to think then of how it is that people might take the space of custom as being a space of freedom and not just as a space of conservative reaction. And the reason I think that that's, this is a comment, I'm sorry, I'm going on, but the reason I think that that's important to keep in mind is that it means that even though one might want to oppose where that ends up politically, it makes it appear to be less without reason to begin with, and therefore that one can have interlocutors, right? It's not just something one has to take as one's enemy, but there's actually a common commitment to freedom, which, which you can see even in the discourse of custom that often takes very conservative forms. Should we, should we take two more? Alright, maybe we could respond to that. Last people are thinking about that. <coughs> <laughs> I mean, 
what I'm interested in is a kind of rhetoric that, that juxtaposes tradition with modernity, that comes about in the face of opposing <laughs> something that seemed to be very foreign. Right? So I'm not saying that in a blanket sense that custom is like reactionary in this, but I'm saying that in this particular context, there's a way in which modernity and tradition are seen to be juxtaposed in the rhetoric of the hearings. So there's a way in which there's this new thing, there's this democracy that's seen to be threatening, right? And that homosexuality in some how comes to symbolize stuff that seemed to be threatening to tradition and culture. So it becomes framed in that like modernity tradition dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I'm not wanting to like endorse or reinforce that, but I'm just saying in the rhetoric of the hearings that that is certainly something that is very prominent. And I think in discussions about homosexuality in particular, this kind of framing is very common. So yes, I can understand that you know there's an absolutely a role for traditional and uh, customary law. It's not it's something that's terribly important and intrinsic to people's sense of self and opposition and resistance to encroachments of all kinds. But what is interesting is the way in which, and I mean you're saying that there's a space of freedom, but I think there are limits to that sort of space of freedom when it comes to controversial issues <coughs> like emerging LGBT identities which are seen to be very new and very recent and some kind of a fundamental threat to a particular way of life as is often the case and certainly not unique to Africa or wherever it's a very common thing but they're kind of the limits of freedom and that's why the kind of sexual orientation is such a contentious issue in this country because it's along that sort of that, uh, you know, it, 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 it cuts across the fault lines of the Constitution, which is trying to, in some way, accommodate sort of customary law, and at the same time, mm -hmm. have as the overarching principle the Bill of Rights. And in a sense, you know, those two are going to be in conflict. Yes, Blake? Um. We really kind of a metaphorical point of view as well. Um, gay is occupying space between Africa and the West, and then you kind of put on with a series of other um, places or metaphors that that works within. And uh, I just found that point especially intriguing. I wonder if you could just unpack that a little further. <coughs> well, I think that there's a position of liminality which can be seen to be potentially destructive or powerful and creative. So I think, you know, if you're not a hairstylist in rural Malaga, you're neither, right? So there's a way in which that gender ambiguity, because it's seen to occupy the minimum space, can also be seen to have that is a certain kind of spiritual power, a certain healing power, and I think that that also accounts for the attraction of the African independent churches for a number of gay people, because a lot of people are seen to have a special role in that church. Not despite their cross-dressing, but because of their cross-dressing. So somehow, because they seem to occupy a liminal space in terms of gender, sort of neither man nor woman, somewhere in between, they also seem to occupy some kind of liminal space between the spiritual and the sort of secular world and stuff. So that the way in which many of the gay people, and particularly the person I was talking about there, was seen to have a special role in the church, is that he himself had a, had, had a particularly good singing voice. So he was seen to be able to create a climate in which the Holy Spirit could be invoked to do the kind of healing work of the church. So I see a parallel between that and the kind of role of the healer within, um, within some context in which someone with a sort of gender ambiguity can, can occupy that place. So that, but that's very same liminality can also be seen to be dangerous and threatening. And so that's why I'm saying that there's a series of associations between homosexuality and like two uncomfortably close to the West. So, you know, that this, and that that can also be seen not as creative and productive, but also as destructive.